and welcome to my presentation of uh, biased RSA private keys with the subtitle of uh, Origin Attribution of GCD Factorable Keys. Uh, this paper is a joint work of, of me and my colleagues who all come from the Center for Research on Cryptography and Security uh, from Masaryk University in, in Czech Republic. In the next uh, 20 minutes or so, we will first cover what, what exactly is the, is the bias in RSA keys and how we can use, the, use it to fingerprint actually keys to their origin library. And then we will explore um, what it takes to obtain GCD factorable keys and how we can actually, how we can reveal their, their origin using our method. Uh, if you're watching this video, you probably cannot ask me any questions directly because I'm not available for the, for the conference. Still, you can contact me via email that is listed here on the, on the title page of the presentation. So please feel free to do so. So let, let's dive into the topic. Uh, imagine that you have ordinary RSA key, just, just like that. And uh, basically, the main question that we aim to answer with our research is, um, where was the key generated? What is the source of the key? Is it, was it generated on some smart cards or hardware secure model or a software library and so on? If you don't know anything about the key, then the reasonable guess would be OpenSSL library, right? Because the OpenSSL library is responsible for many keys on the internet and it's really prevalent source of keys, let, let's say. But uh, it was discovered several years ago that this key cannot actually come from the OpenSSL library because it was generated uh, using some special, special RSA prime generation algorithm that is used in Infineon smart cards. And so this is an this is this is an interesting fact because um, you might expect that that all keys um, in RSA kind of look look similar or so. So let's just let's just go for a second and dive into how the RSA keys look like. Actually, uh, they consist of a public part which is called modulus that virtually is nothing else but a product of uh, two large primes P and Q. Now, these primes are selected uh, randomly, but uh, they are not selected, often they are not selected uniformly from the pool of possible primes. And yeah, the previous research looked at only at the modulus n. So, but the bias actually resides or originates from the, from the primes p and q. So it's, it's somewhat, the bias somewhat propagates to the modulus n, but, but not completely. And by looking at the primes p and q directly, you can get much more, much more, um, precise results with respect to the, to the bias. So the whole, world, the whole work opened in 2016 when uh, my colleague Peter Schwenda and another colleagues, they identified several sources of bias in, in public keys. So this allowed them to build a probabilistic uh, machine learning model, if, if you will, that was capable of recognizing 13 distinct groups of keys uh, with accuracy roughly, roughly 40%. And in 2017, uh, they w their work actually resulted into so-called ROCA vulnerability, also known as return of the Coppersmith attack, presented at the CCS conference. And um, what this means is that they basically identified a source of RSA keys that were practically factorable and were quite prevalent. They were actually found in millions of devices around the world, including a Slovakian electronic ID cards, for instance. And what allowed them actually to identify this, this, uh, this problem was the, the bias in the RSA keys. So this is uh, just, just for motivation, it's important to, to study this bias. Now, all the previous research basically looked into, onto, onto public keys and the argument kind of seems natural. And the argument is, uh, yeah, you typically have public keys for scrutiny or for analysis, but where would you get the private keys exactly? You don't, if you want to analyze the RSA keys, you don't usually have the, the private keys, right? But we identified that there are actually at least three, maybe even more sources, reasonable use cases when you, when you have the, the private keys available. One of them is a personal scrutiny if you want to maybe evaluate the bias in, in your key. Um, second, more important is uh, if you're running a company and you have like tens or maybe hundreds of RSA keys, you want to, you want to be able to, to analyze those as well, and you typically have access to your private keys in, in such case, because it's sort of trusted environment. And maybe the most important is if you have um, access to some factored RSA keys that maybe were found weak, or maybe there some method emerged that uh, made them factorable practically, and these key, you don't know the source of these keys. 
they coming they are coming from unknown source. In such case, you can obtain the primes, and you can you can investigate what what is the source of the keys. Um, this is actually the scenario of the uh, keys that uh, share some prime with with another key, and uh, therefore can be can be uh, factored by greatest common divisor algorithm. Uh, I'll talk about about that later on. Don't worry. So let's let's dive into uh, what are actually the sources of, of the bias in, in RSA keys. Now uh, the first reason that that introduces bias in, in RSA keys is our performance optimizations. Often um, you want to generate the primes as quickly as possible, and you don't want to use like trial and error approach. You want to be sort of at least partially deterministic, or maybe just narrow down the pool of primes that you're choosing from for your RSA key. So this, for instance, leads into fixing some, some bits of primes so that you obtain the, the modulus of the desired length. And this, this is the first source of bias that, that we encountered and previous research also encountered during their analysis. Also, some libraries tend to favor maybe provable primes uh, that you know they are constructed in using an algorithm that produces provable primes. And some uh, libraries tend to choose strong primes. Some just uh, construct the, the primes using probabilistic algorithms. And uh, this is another source of bias section. Also, some libraries, uh, some libraries do order primes by their size. For instance, P is always larger than Q, and Q is always larger than P, or they are, they are unordered. But if you think, uh, if you uh, factorize the key, practically, you don't know what is P and Q. So you can't really use this, but I just, I just mentioned it for an illustration. This is another source of bias. Also, there are some proprietary algorithms used for generating primes, maybe for generating primes of some special form, such was the case of the return of the Coppersmith attack when the Infineon cards were generating were generated using using um, a proprietary algorithm in order to speed up the computations. Last but not least, if you spot, if you manage to get like millions of, of keys, you can maybe spot uh, bias in the output of the underlying uh, pseudo random number generator. There are of course some natural properties of primes. These are they are not uniformly distributed uh, as, as well, but uh, you cannot really exploit those to the fingerprinting of the of the keys. Another interesting question that remains to be that uh, remains to be answered in order to, to continue with our presentation is whether um, if you take a look at maybe 500 bit long keys, whether they have the same properties as uh, two kilobyte keys and so on. So the previous research um, conjectured that this is the true. Our, our uh, experimental analysis confirms this fact. So if you want to do some kind of analysis on, on the bias of RSA keys, it suffices to take a look at the short keys, at the 512 bit long keys, uh, which you can work easily with. They are faster to compute stuff on and, and so on. So in the rest of the presentation, I'll be talking basically about uh, 512 bit keys, but um, our results are directly applicable to the uh, longer keys that are nowadays used on a daily basis. Yes, that's the answer. OK, so let's cover how, how we are attributing the GCD factor of the keys. What, what is the process that takes us to the, to the desired result? Now, first of all, uh, we collect many RSA keys. Actually, the previous research collected something like 60 or 70 million of keys. We expanded that to 160 million of keys. And these are generated from uh, 70, 70 different sources. Yeah. On those keys, we, we basically analyze the bias in them, and we extract the features. And looking at the feature set, we say, OK, we are able to recognize these this number of classes, this number of different sources. Because you can have two sources that are producing uh, keys that have the same uh, distribution with respect to your feature set. They are basically producing identical keys. When you have, when you have the classes, we, we, we built a model that is capable of recognizing between those classes, and we train them, train that model on a, on a training set. Um, what, what we do then is that we evaluated the model on a, on a test set, and we use the greatest common divisor methods to factorize keys from IPv4 wide scans that collected basically TLS, TLS certificates with keys in them. And this is how we got to the result. And the result is that we were able to narrow down the possible sources of, uh, of the factorable GCD factorable keys on the internet. 
So in the rest of the presentation, we will cover basically that this is the outline. In the rest of the presentation, we will cover uh, all, all these steps. So I already covered uh, the first step. So now, now let's sh talk shortly about, about the features in the, that we used for our, for our classifiers. So the first feature is the most five most significant bits of both primes as they tend to be biased due to performance optimization in the libraries. So uh, we look at, we extract from the key the five most significant bits of both primes. Now, what we do next is that we check whether the primes are blown primes, so are of special form, or whether they are just generic primes. Uh, the third feature that we use is that uh, we analyze uh, whether the small divisors of P minus one and Q minus one are avoided up to some value. Uh, during our analysis, we encountered that there are uh, four possible values uh, that serve as a breakpoint. Some sources basically do not care about uh, divisors of P minus one and Q minus one. Some want to avoid that they don't have any small divisors up to the value of five. There are some sources that avoid small div divisors up to the value of 251. And finally, uh, this is the last breakpoint. So there are four possible values with respect to this feature. And the last feature that we utilize is so-called Roca fingerprint, which basically uh, was adapted from the Roca paper. And that is able, this fingerprint is able to reliably capture the vulnerable keys to the, to the return of the copper smith attack. So when you, when you have the features, let's, let's for a moment consider that we want to analyze only the keys that originate from smart cards. Now, if we, if we limit ourselves to the smart card domain, uh, then we are able to recognize, we measure basically there the distance of the distributions of the keys that the sources are producing. So if you take a look at this picture, basically we say that uh, in group 10, there are two sources of keys that we, we are not able to, to differentiate between because they are producing very similar keys. On the other hand, the keys from group 10, they are very distant because you have to travel all the way through the dendrogram. They are very distant from the sources from group one. That is actually, this is actually the Roca vulnerable card. And so we are able to recognize between group one and group 10. Uh, some groups are small, containing only a single single source. Some groups groups are larger. They are using more generic methods to generate the RSA keys. And so this is the way that we obtain the classes for our classifier. Now, considering that our feature set is quite narrow, we have only four features, and that we have uh, 150 million of, of uh, training examples, we use so-called bias classifier, which is a very simple model for um, for classification, but it tends to work well when you have uh, many large training data set and quite narrow set of features. It's basically nothing else but a table of empirical probabilities. During the training time, you, uh, you go individually through each key, and you, for each possible feature vector, you will count the most probable source with, with, for that feature vector. And then during the test time, uh, when you will witness some, um, some feature vector, for instance, this is the feature vector, so these are the five most significant bits of P, of Q. The key is not using blum primes. Um, the key is avoiding divisors up to the value of five, and uh, it is not uh, Roca fingerprinted. If you encounter such a uh, feature vector, you will basically check what is the most probable source uh, with respect to this feature vector. And that, that's virtually it. It's really naive, but it, it works well. So as I already mentioned, in our data set, we had 157 million of training keys, and we left nearly two million of keys uh, into the test set. So uh, if we do not limit ourselves to the smart cards or to the TLS keys, uh, if we just uh, take into account all possible keys, sources of keys, then we are able to distinguish between 26 groups. And looking just at a single key, we our model exhibits accuracy of 47%, and we are able to actually fingerprint the keys coming from three groups reliably, meaning that we achieve 100% accuracy on those keys. So let's, let's dive into the, into the topic of GCD factorable keys. Uh, now, this was actually discovered in 2012 independently by two teams. One was led by Len Stridol, and the second uh, team consisted of a group of American researchers uh, with Nadia Henninger and, and others included. And their results were confirmed in 2016 
showing that almost 1% of the RSA keys found in the TLS certificates were practically factorable. Now, the reason for that, it, it's quite a large number if you think about that. The reason for that is that uh, some devices, but these are mostly producing self-signed self keys, some devices uh, produce the keys right after the boot when they don't have uh, sufficient entropy available, which leads to, um, to the fact that two distant devices actually produce right after the boot, they produced RSA key that shares the first prime. The second prime already has uh, enough entropy available in the uh, pseudo-random number generator, so it, it's, not, it's not the same. And uh, if you have, yeah, if you have uh, two keys that share a single prime, it's actually, it's actually um, quite easy to factor them using greatest common divisor algorithm, so it's quite easy. Now, uh, we, have, we have leveraged the great work of the RAPID7 data set to obtain uh, IPv4 white TLS scans from ranging from October 2013 to July 2019. And we analyzed those and factored as many keys as possible and look at the results, basically. Now, we were also leveraging two, two assumptions. The first assumption is that if you take uh, many keys, a batch of, of keys, and they share a prime, we assume that they were all generated by sources coming from a single classification group. Most probably they were even generated by a source, by a single source. Now the second assumption is that uh, if the malformed keys share only one prime, the pseudo-random number generator was receded with enough entropy before the second prime got, got generated. Uh, in our paper we, we explain why these are most reasonable assumptions. They pretty much, we are pretty much sure that they, they hold. And they enable us to, to attribute the unknown sources of, of TCD keys, TCD factorable keys. Because apart from the OpenSSL, it is not known which sources were or are still producing the factorable keys. So our research actually, actually led to, to narrowing down the list of possible sources. So let's, let's check how reliable are our results, because we have to adapt the model a bit um, due to the correlation in the, in the primes uh, found in the GCD factorable keys. And if you take a look, uh, we can recognize between 10 groups of, it's less than 10 groups of sources. And if we look only at a single key, we only achieve 36% uh, accuracy on average, which is, which is definitely not a good result. But the advantage of our method is that you can take a batch of keys that are coming from the same source, and you can classify them together to get much more reliable results. And uh, in our research, we limited ourselves to uh, batches of at least 10 keys coming from the same source. And uh, here we exhibit, uh, exhibit accuracy of 77%. Actually, the mean value of the, si of the batch size that we encountered in our data set was 15. So we are looking at uh, accuracy somewhere between 77 and 85 percent, which is which is quite good, if you consider the the random guess accuracy, which is much more much more lower, something like nine percent or, or, or so. Now, let's dive into the results. We actually obtained 82 different primes uh, comprising that uh, that split into two 2,500 batches roughly. Now. Our classifier reported the following results. 88% roughly of the batches were reporting as coming from the OpenSSL, which uh, well matches the previous research that reported similar fraction because the OpenSSL library was already attributed before. Now, three batches uh, were thought to be coming from the uh, specifically compiled version of the OpenSSL library that we called 8-bit OpenSSL. And more importantly, we identified as 11 batches is coming from, from these sources, which also means that we have uh, other six groups that actually cover 13 sources, and these groups are very improbable sources of keys. So if you, if you know that your keys were, was generated uh, from some, some of these 13 sources, it is very improbable that uh, it shares some, some uh, prime with other key on the internet. So this basically brings us to the conclusions. Uh, during our research, we showed that if you, if you take private keys into account, uh, they make the whole classification process much more precise. And from 40% accuracy on 13 groups that was uh, achieved using public keys, we managed to get onto 47%. But 
on 26 group, which is a which is a large increase of accuracy. Now we discovered that there are actually real world use cases of the private key classification uh, that make our contribution worthwhile. And if you if you limit the domain of the possible sources, you can get even more um, even more reliable models or you can take actually a batch of keys and you get much more reliable results as well. For instance, if you take 10 keys on the not limiting yourself onto the domain, uh, you, will, you will be working with a classifier that is in nearly 90% of decisions correct compared to 4% uh, accuracy of a random guess baseline model. So this is kind of, kind of good result. 